Let's, I'm going I'm to have you uh, turn, if you have your Bibles or if you want to open up your phones. We're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. In 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, Paul spends about, about as much time as he does anywhere in the Scripture. These are the two chapters where Paul teaches most about money and giving, money and possessions, how the work of the church gets funded. And what I want to talk about is that God wants all of us, each one of us, God wants us to be generous stewards, generous with the resources that he has entrusted to us. If I were to ask you, who's the most generous person you've ever encountered in your life? Who's the person who has modeled for you more than anyone else generosity and stewardship? Does, do you have somebody come to mind? You're nodding your head. Do you mind if I call you out? Who is the person that came to mind when you, I, I thought of that? One of your closest friends. A generous person, right? Somebody else have somebody come to mind who's just modeled generosity for you in your life? Pastor John? A grandfather. There is something kind of attractive about people who live a generous life, isn't there? This is my wife, Susan, the fabulous Susan Willard. We've been married now for 34 years. We, we met in college. I met, I met Jesus and Susan <laughs> at the University of Massachusetts. A lot of people didn't even know Jesus was there, but he was right there on campus, and so was Her Highness. And we have, um, we have been married ever since. And when we graduated from college, we went into ministry together serving as missionaries with, with Campus Crusade for Christ. It's now called Crew. That's how we got to Orlando, by the way, because some of you might know that Crew's headquarters are here in Orlando. So as a young couple, we're out there sharing our faith in Jesus Christ with college students. And in order to sustain that ministry, like missionaries do, we had a team of people that prayed for us and financially supported our work. We didn't, you know, we didn't get a salary that paid by Campus Crusade. We had people give, and that's how we lived. We did that for 18 years. Um, one of the people that we met early in our, our marriage was, was uh, this person that I think of when I think of the most generous person I've ever encountered, or one of them at least. His name was Mr. Johnson. Ted Johnson was a rose grower in New England, in Massachusetts. He had the largest rose growing outfit east of California. That's like the whole country, right? So he had figured out this genius way, even in a cold climate like New England, he had figured out a genius way to heat his, his uh, greenhouses, and he had this massive rose-growing outfit very close to where we went to college. Now, we knew Mr. Johnson was a generous person. We assumed we probably weren't the only little couple that would come by and he would talk to us and support our ministry. I also knew he was very committed to supporting the work of his local church and investing faithfully there. So I'll remember uh, sitting with him one time, Susan and I were there. By the way, you ever have one of these moments in your life and you can recall it like that? It's kind of imprinted in your memory. It was impactful enough that it's not just a distant memory. It's something that you can almost still see and feel. This conversation with Mr. Johnson was like that for me. We're sitting in his family room and I said, Mr. Johnson, why do you do it? Why are you so generous? And I really wanted to hear his answer. And he sort of sat back and he said, um, well, it seems to me that the Lord has been really, really good to me and my family. And then he said, and the more I give, the more the Lord blesses me. And I'll never forget that moment. Because I remember thinking to myself, I want to live like that. I want to be that kind of person who, who knows what it means to be generous and who trusts God to meet his needs. Mr. Johnson was great by the way. He would always give Susan roses. You know, he'd show up and he might hand her a dozen long stem roses. Some guy's giving my wife roses, you know? But I didn't mind, he was about 80. So I thought, I'd probably knock him out if I had to, you know? <laughs> but he was a wonderfully generous person and one of the people that God has used in my life to inspire me to wanna to live a generous life. I wanna encourage you Generosity is something that God wants for you, not from you. 
So let's take a look at this passage then in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning in verse 6, it says this, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. I have five sort of big ideas I'd like to share with you from this passage about what it means to take the next step in becoming the generous Christian that God wants us to be, okay? Five big ideas. The first one is this. Generosity begins with God. That's the first one. Generosity begins with God. He is the supplier of all that you have. The passage puts it this way. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase, increase your store of seed. God is the owner of everything. God, generosity begins with him. He's not only the supplier, he's the owner, and we are his managers or stewards. A steward or a manager is someone who isn't the owner, but rather who manages wisely and well on behalf of the owner what those resources might be. Uh, from the beginning pages of Scripture, we read and learn that God owns everything. Deuteronomy 10 puts it this way. To the Lord your God belong the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth and everything in it. You know what in the Hebrew what the word everything means? Everything. It's not complicated. It's everything that you have. God actually is the owner of. Psalm 24 puts it this way. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Randy Alcorn says this, you won't find a single verse of scripture that suggests that God has surrendered his ownership to us. He is still the owner of everything. It's an amazing thought, isn't it? You have it, but actually God owns it. And by the way, you might think, well, it, you know, at least I own myself. Right? I have sort of some control over myself, right? Well, you don't even own yourself. What does the Bible say? You're not your own. You were bought with a price. You belong to God. So you are not an owner. You are a manager. You are not an owner. You are a steward of God's resources. Howard Dayton puts it this way. What I possess, God owns. Would you say that with me? What I possess, God owns. That is a true truth. And something really worth kind of taking to heart. You have some stuff. You have some resources. You have gifts. You have abilities. You have time. You have breath. You manage those things. God owns them. Your stuff's not yours. It belongs to God, and he wants us to use it wisely and well. Generosity begins with God. That's the first big idea. Generosity begins with him, and he wants us to be generous with the things, the money, the time he's entrusted to us. And again, it is not because somehow God needs something from you. He owns everything. He owns it all. I remember one time when Susan and I were newly married, where I was preaching in a church in, in um, Virginia, and I shared that we're trusting God to raise support for us, and he's going to provide for our ministry. And I said, you know, the Bible says that God owns all the cattle on a thousand hills. And I'm just praying that he's going to sell some of that cattle and we're going to get some of that money so we can do our ministry. I was just trying to be funny, right? Susan will, not, will, will remember this. After that service, a couple walked up to us and he's kind of like this and she's sort of elbowing him. Go ahead. Tell him. Tell him what happened. And this couple at breakfast that morning, he says to his wife, hey, sweetheart, what do you think God wants us to do with that money we got from that cattle that we sold? That actually happened. Because God gets it. God cares. I don't have to be an owner 
God will provide for my needs. And that couple recognized that cattle didn't belong to them. Those, those were God's cattle, and he's going to use that money to honor, to honor God. Generosity is not something God wants from you. It's something he wants for you. Second big idea I want to share here is that generosity results in blessing. What you give away will multiply. What you give away will multiply. So remember this, the Bible says, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need. I love that. There is something that happens. God recognizes that we have needs and he wants to meet those needs for us. He meets our needs, not everything we want. We know that, right? And by the way, this is not some sort of like deal that we make with God. If I give this, then God will give me that. That is his bad theology, right? God is not obligated to do anything for you because of something that you do, but because of his great love for you, he wants to bless you. And sometimes, friends, sometimes the blessing is not financial. You ever given away something financially and then had a financial setback after? And you're kind of saying, uh, excuse me, Lord. That's not how this works. Right? I mean, I gave this money away. You're supposed to give me this thing, right? And God says, oh, son, I will bless you. I will care for you. I love you. But it's not always like that. It's not all. Isn't the world full, friends? Isn't the world full of wonderful, godly believers in Jesus Christ who struggle financially? Of course it is. Is God not blessing them? Of course he is. So this can't be like that. It's not some sort of quid pro quo. If I do this, God has to do that. But there is a blessing when we step out and give. There just is. God somehow multiplies the gift that we give so that both the receiver and the giver get a blessing. So cool. A few years ago, Susan and I had a, an old uh, car, a Mazda Tribute, little SUV, a little, it was white. It was, it was safe, but it wasn't really that great. We were going to sell it. And uh, and get something else. And uh, then we heard about this young couple, this missionary couple, uh, that they needed a car. So, oh, you know, Lord, I pray that you'll help them get a car, you know. <laughs> right? Amen. <laughs> so, you know, I said to Susan, uh, what do you think? She said, uh-huh. So, you know, this isn't about us, by the way. Like, look at what we did. But here's what was so cool. You in your life, you should get to have the kind of phone call that I had with this guy when I told him that we think God wants us to give them the car. I want that for you. I want you to experience what a blessing it was for me to get to be the one that got to make that phone call. And then the cool thing is this, this wife, who's just a wonderfully godly young woman, she, she said, listen, I, Lord, I'll just, whatever car you want me to have, I'll just take whatever you want me to have. You know, she's a missionary. But, but she had been praying, you ready for this? She had been praying for an SUV, and she wished it could be white. She just liked it. And when his, her husband said, it's an SUV, and it's white, I mean, imagine just the detail that God goes to. Imagine the minute detail that God takes. Why? Because he loves you, that's why. He just, he's just crazy about you, and he wants to bless you. And the crazy thing is, sometimes to bless you, he'll use me. That's just fantastic, isn't it? I want to be in on that, don't you? God multiplies the gift and blesses both the giver and the receiver. It's just a very, very cool concept. Generosity begins with God. He blesses us. And one of the reasons he does that is so that we can be a blessing to others. Specifically, he's able to, again, the passage says, God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be a generous person. Be generous on every occasion. It's so cool. You are blessed to be a blessing. And churches are blessed by God to bless others as well. As Pastor was saying, if you had started in Acts chapter 1, and if you had hung in there, 
for, for four days, you would have gotten to Acts chapter 4. And one of the things that you would have heard in Acts chapter 4 is this amazing description of, of a church that believes what Pastor John has been teaching us is that God is calling us to be an extravagantly generous church. I mean, he, Pastor John is sharp, but he didn't come up with that idea on his own. He found it right here in the pages of Scripture. And in Acts chapter 4, we see a picture of what this extravagantly generous church looks like. It says this, all the believers were one in heart and mind. Amen. Wouldn't that be nice? No bickering, no fighting, unity. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own. Why? Because it's God's stuff, not mine. But they shared everything they had. There were no needy persons among them. Amazing. Why? Because from time to time, those who had owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sale, put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to everyone as they had need. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. That's what church looks like right there. People being extravagantly generous to their brothers and sisters in Christ, recognizing that when God blesses me, it isn't so that I can have more stuff. It's so that I can be a blessing to others. God is, God is providing for me, but not just for me. He's providing for me so that through me, he can provide for others. This is a wonderful principle. And it's, it's, it's right here in the pages of scripture. Again, Randy Alcorn puts it wonderfully. He says this, God comes right out and tells us why he gives us more money than we need. It's not that we can, so that we can find more ways to spend it. It's not so we can indulge ourselves and spoil our children. It's not so that we can insulate ourselves from needing God's provision. It's so that we can give and give generously. Too often, we assume that God has increased our income to increase our standard of living when his stated purpose is to increase our standard of giving. That's why he blesses you, so that you can be a blessing to others. And so who is it that he's blessing? The person who's holding on to the stuff? No, the person who is saying, Lord, if you want to bless others through me, let's do it. I want to be in on this, Lord. I want to be a part of being a blessing to others. As you pour out your blessing on me, I will share it freely in a way that honors you and blesses others. That's a, that's a wonderful adventure to be on. And it's a fantastic kind of church to be a part of, isn't it? But generosity is, is like other practices, isn't it? You, you know, it's not something that you just kind of, oh, yeah, all of a sudden you just become generous. You just get it. No, you, you know, why, why is pastor having us take five minutes a day, five days a week? Because it takes time to learn to be a person who is letting the Bible speak to you. And so in the same way, it takes time for us to create the kind of plan that we need to create to become a generous person. Christian generosity requires a plan. Again, the passage says, each of you should give what you have decided. There's the key word. What you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. Why? Because God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a giver who has a plan, who has decided to give and isn't doing it under compulsion. I have to give. I don't want to, but they're making me. No, that's not it. How many of you are planning people by nature? To make a plan, work the plan, you're a planner, right? Any of you a little bit more, make it up as you go along, kind of keep your options open, right? You know, let's not plan. I don't want to get tied down too much, right? Uh, yeah, any of you planning people, do you, do, you, um, do you make lists? Any list making people? Yes, good. Uh, and you just know because you make a list, you're going to get some stuff done, right? Do any of you uh, have another person in your life who makes lists for you? Susan. Susan will make a list for me every now and then. I'll see it on the counter. There'll be a list. You know what I do with that list usually? I do it. Because stuff gets done when I do that list. It's good. Do any of you list people do this? If you do something that wasn't on your list, do you write it down and then check it off? Who does that? That is just wrong, by the way. That's like, that's pathological is what that is. That you, write this down. Get some help. Check that off, okay? That's messed up. But here's why you do it. I know why you do it. You have discovered, those of you that are planners, you have discovered that sometimes if I don't have a plan, it doesn't get done. 
It just doesn't. So do I want to become a better, do I want to know God better? Let me make a plan to read my Bible. Do I want to become the generous Christian that God wants me to be? What's my plan? How am I going to get there? That's the key here. And it's sort of like thinking about this as a process, thinking about this as a journey is really helpful. Because what it means is, all I'm asking is, Lord, what is my next step? What's my next step in becoming the generous Christian that you've called me to be? I, what, what, would, what would you have me do now? What would you have me do next? And I'll take that step with your help. So I want to talk about that for a few minutes, and I want to describe what some of those steps might be. And as I do, I would love to ask you to think about what's my next step? Like, where am I in the journey of becoming the generous Christian that God has called me to be? And what might my next step be? Could you do that with me? Don't ask what's this other guy's next step. What's my next step? So if you're a part of a church like The Outpouring, and uh, you're starting to really get plugged in maybe, and you're starting to meet people and you like it, there is a season normally for people when they become connected to a church where they're connected to the church, but they haven't started giving yet. And you know what? That's okay. Pastor John is not trying to run you off, okay? No one around here is going to say to you, you're not welcome here because you're not a giver. You're welcome here. But the first step in this journey of becoming the generous Christian that God might want you to be, is to become what you could call an initial giver. I've never given before. I'll give for the first time. It's a one-time, one-step, I wasn't in before, now I'm in. And there are, it's possible that there are some of you here this morning, and again, there is no judgment here at all, but it is possible that for some of you, you've been a part of this church, but you've never given. You know what the step you might want to take is? I'm going to give for the very first time. And when we get to the end of our service here, it will be an offering time, a time for us to give back to God. Maybe you'll take that step today. That's the first step for you to consider. Now, most of us have probably already taken that step. And for a lot of us in the room, what you probably are is what I would consider to be sort of like an occasional giver. You give when you can. You know what I'm talking about? You give when you feel like you have, well, and again, I'm no, no criticism here. You give when you have a little bit of extra money. You give when you feel sort of inspired to give. You give when something touches your heart. You give occasionally. Praise God for that. That's good. But it's the step that you should consider taking, I think, is to become an intentional giver. Instead of just giving occasionally when you can, when you feel motivated to, when you feel moved to, no. You're the person who, as the passage said, is going to decide in their heart, I'm going to give this amount on a regular basis. Now, most of us think about money as a monthly thing. You know what I mean? Right? You, don't, you think about how much is my rent? How much is my mortgage? If I have a car payment, how much is my car payment? If I have a cell phone, which everybody, you know anybody that doesn't have a cell phone? I mean, you can't, you have a bill. It comes monthly. We think about our money, don't we? We tend to think about our money in monthly chunks. So sometimes the intentional giver is going to say for the very first time, you know what, Lord, I'm going to decide in my heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, I am going to decide in my heart to give this much per month. What a great step that is. That's a fantastic step for somebody to take. It might be the step that you should take or could take to become more of a generous Christian. Now, the next step is a cool concept, and this is a person who's who's a proportional giver. Proportional givers are not setting aside a dollar amount. They're actually deciding what percentage, what portion of what it is that God entrusts to me will I give. Here's a genius principle. And by the way, this principle of proportional giving is right here in the scriptures. This is the genius principle is that if you're a proportional giver, guess what happens to your giving when your income goes up? Your giving goes up. It's like, a, it's like a cool idea. And so I'm giving proportionally, and as God blesses me, which he sometimes does, my, my giving will also increase. So what percentage of your income are you giving? Are you a proportional giver who is giving a percentage of your income? Something to think about. The Bible has a, a lot to say about that because the Bible teaches, and I'm sure that Pastor John has taught this to you before, the Bible teaches the concept of the tithe or giving a tenth of what it is that God has entrusted to us. By the way, it's not just the 10th, it's the first 10th. 
The principle of tithing, it is almost more about the priority than it is about the percentage. The, important, the most important part of tithing is not that it's 10%, but rather, friends, it's the first 10%. Because you're saying, God, you're first. And so I'm going to give this portion first to you. So that may be the step that some of you might want to take. I would call that person a faithful giver. A person who has said, you know what, Lord, I am going to trust you that this principle of tithing that I can find in the scripture, I'm going to trust you that if I faithfully give the first tenth of what it is that you entrust to me, that I can count on you taking care of me. I'm going to go for it. Now, some of us brought up in the church, you've heard tithing before, right? You know about tithing. It's not the first time you've heard it. What's amazing is that most people don't do it. They just don't. Um, And again, no judgment, no criticism. No one's up here wagging a finger at you about that. But that is a wonderfully good step for some of us to take who've never taken it. Now, sometimes, though, we could have taken that step some number of years ago, and we're, we're tithing. And some of you, that may be the case with you. And not only are you tithing, but you're pretty sure that tithing is the right thing to do. And you kind of wonder why no one, why isn't everybody else tithing? Like, what's the matter with these people, you know? Like, what's wrong with them, you know? Um, and you might be li- almost a little bit proud of the fact that you're tithing. Like, I tithe, you tithe, I'm a tither, you tithe, right? <laughs> uh, pastor down in South Florida, his name is Bob Coy, used to call that guy what he would call a tickled tither. I love that. He's a little bit proud of the fact that he's a tithing person, right? As if to somehow suggest that becoming a tither was the finish line. Well, once you become a tither, you're good to go now. Do whatever you want with the rest of that money. Well, wait a minute. Whose money is it? It was always God's. Even that other 90% is still God's. You still don't get to do whatever you want with it, right? It's still his. So the next step is a radical step. And I I call that a radical giver. You're going to go beyond just tithing. You know, here's what this person's doing. Here's what's amazing. At the beginning of this journey, becoming an initial giver, a person says something like this, Lord, maybe not even Lord. They might even just say, self. How How much of my money am I going to give? That's what they're saying. By the time you get to the end of this journey, you know what you're saying? Lord, Lord God Almighty, how much of your money do you want me to keep? Because I'm going to give away the rest. That's radical. I mean, that's crazy. You know anybody who lives like that? But you know what, friends? That's normal Christianity. That's just just what normal people should be doing who are believing their Bible. Saying, I am going to... I'm going to sit down and figure out with God's help, how much does it cost for me to to care for my family, to provide for the needs that we have, to enjoy the life that God wants us to live? You don't have to be, you know, live in in a hut or something like that. But I'm going to say, Lord, this is your money. I will, I, will, I will use a portion of it to care for myself and for my family's needs, but I am giving the rest of it back to the kingdom of God. That's radical. And that is a step for some of us to take. Okay, so we talked about this kind of process, right? Where are you? You know, um, growth always comes down to you making some sort of a decision, a choice of what you're going to do with what you've heard. Imagine if all you had to do was hear good content for it to change you. You'd be pretty awesome already, wouldn't you? (laughs) I mean, you heard some good stuff in your life, haven't you? If all you had to do was hear it for it to make a difference in your life, wouldn't you be incredible? No, it isn't just hearing. It isn't just information that leads to transformation. It's information and application that leads to transformation. All those in favor of some change in your life say aye. Aye. You got to do something. You got to take a step. What is the step that God wants you to take? Finally, last point. Your generosity inspires others to look to God. Generosity is contagious. Generosity is catalytic. Generosity causes people to say, what in the world's going on over there, right? And I want to be in a church that looks like that. And I think you do too. And again, if you had hung in there until day six, 
of the Bible study reading program, you would have gotten to Acts chapter 6, and here's what you would have read in verse 1 of Acts 6. Again, the church is brand new. They're just getting started. Here's what it says. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. We just talked about how in chapter 4, they're caring for each other, right? They're meeting each other's needs. It's all good. Well, it's not all good because the Greek-speaking widows were getting missed. Well, you know, they're on their own, I guess, right? No, that's awful. These, these were very needy women. To be a, wi a widow was to be in trouble. No one to care for you. And by the way, do you notice the difference is the Greek-speaking widows were being overlooked. Is there some sort of bias happening here in the church? Here in Acts chapter 6, is this the, the seed of ethnic discrimination or bias? This is ugly. This is wrong, right? This is a problem that the church needs to solve. And it's a generosity problem, but it could be even bigger than that, right? They don't get this straightened out, but of course they do. The 12, the leaders of the church, gather all the disciples and say, it wouldn't be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We'll turn this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. What they're saying is, this is a problem that needs to get solved. This is very important, but it's not necessarily the work of the leaders of the church to solve it. So let's find some other grown up Christians who walk with God and let them begin to solve that problem. And they do that. And it's wonderful. They choose people to take care of it. If you read the rest of the passage, you'll discover that the names of some of the people that they choose are Greek names. That was smart, right? Let's pick some people that know the neighborhood, right? They can get in there and deal with the people that are in need. Brilliant. As you read this passage, you should, you should think to yourself, well, they had a problem, they solved the problem. They fed the Greek widows, but it was so much more than that. Because in verse 7 of Acts chapter 6, it says this, so the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Isn't that amazing? When a church decides we're going to be a generous church, when individuals in the church say, I'm going to be a generous person, that's what happens. The word of God spreads. The number of disciples increase. And people who are antagonistic, hateful toward the gospel, submit and come to faith. You want to be in that kind of church? I want, by the way, I want you to be that kind of church. You know why? Because I live right here in this neighborhood. I mean, I'm 10, 15 minutes from here. And as you become the church that God has called you to be, <clears throat> you'll be reaching people that I care about. So what's the step for you? What is the step that God wants you to take? Where are you in this journey of becoming the generous Christian that God wants you to be? And what would it look like for you to say, Lord, I'm taking my next step. I'm going to trust you. Maybe it's to become an initial giver, to give for the very first time. Maybe it's, I'm going to set aside a dollar amount and I'm going to give that by the grace of God. I'm going to give that on a regular basis. Maybe it's to become a proportional giver for the very first time or to start tithing. And for some of us, it's to say, Lord, I'm going beyond that. I'm trusting you. I'm going all in. This is something God wants for you, not from you. But I hope you'll take to heart what it means to take that next step. And I'd like to pray for you if I could. Let's pray. Hey, I pray that you are blessed by the message that you just watched. The gospel always calls for response. And one of the ways that we respond to the gospel is through our giving. We respond through our generosity. God gave extravagantly to us by giving his son Jesus. So when we give to God, we don't give to get something. We give because of what we've already been given. We've been given life through Jesus Christ, the son of God. And so we wanna to give today as a response to the gospel. We're not in the business of taking, but we are in the business of giving. The Outpouring strives to be a ministry that gives to those around us. We wanna be a blessing to our community. And so you can participate and help us 
to be a blessing. And so today we want to invite you to participate in giving. You can give through our text to give at 407 305 2606 right here on the screen, or you can go on our website, outpouringorlando.com, click on the donate tab, and you can give through our website. We just want to say thank you so much. We appreciate you, and we look forward to seeing you real soon. Take care.